Hey folks, today we are going to be taking a little bit of a break from our exposition of Romans chapter 10 to deal with something that has been weighing on my heart for quite some time. Uh, over the years, I've taught on this, preached on this, ministered this quite a bit, uh, whether it be, you know, traveling in conferences, uh, public meetings or home groups. Uh, it just came to my mind the other day that I don't think I've ever done a video about it, so I thought uh, the timing seems very uh, appropriate, and um, it's something that I actually was intending on getting into, and I probably still will a little bit more in depth after our series on Romans chapter 10. Uh, but for some reason, the past, uh, oh, two or three days, um, I've been feeling this impression come on my heart, and so uh, I thought... You know, we'll just take a little bit of a break from this exposition of Romans 10, uh, talk about this for a little bit, and then um, we'll tuck that on the back burner then uh, until after Romans 10 and our study there, and then we'll get into it a little bit more. But I just felt that this was like time sensitive and appropriate for the moment. So what I want to talk with everyone about is a subject and a topic that despite all my travels through the years and whatever conferences and meetings I've been on a public level and as well as small groups, home groups, um, this is an issue that I have not really, I can maybe count one or two ministers that I have ever heard um, get into this uh, in, in much more than a surface level. And this issue is racism. And I know it's not a very popular topic. It's certainly one that is on the news and uh, being talked about around the world today. Um, but unfortunately, there has not really been a clear prophetic voice in the church, at least not in my years on this earth. I have heard very, very few people, like I said, maybe one or two who have gone just beyond a, a casual surface level uh, understanding of it, or at least preaching of it, teaching of it. Um, I, I suppose probably because um, there are a lot of folks out there who quite, well, just to put it plainly, uh, don't have the guts to talk about it. Uh, and like I said, I realized that I don't, I don't really think I've done any videos on this, so let's get into this. Um, I'm going to make a couple startling statements here that are probably going to take some people off. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is the reason why the, 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 the world in general has been so mixed up and confused about a lot of things uh, is because of the harlot church. You know, the name given to the church in uh, the book of the Revelation is Babylon. That is not the name of some worldly financial system or the world in general. The, the name for the harlot church, uh, the Babylon is the name of the harlot church, given to the harlot church in the book of the Revelation, and that name Babylon means mixture and confusion. She is mixed up and confused about a lot of things. And because of that, the image that she has projected to the world about the Father has left the world with a very bitter, sour taste in their mouths to the point where, you know, it, it, it's the truth. A lot of modern-day churchianity, and I call it the big three, you know, you got the uh, American church, modern-day church culture, and the current prophetic movement. It's like a, a three-headed monster. And so much of what they teach and preach and minister it revolves around the classic stuff, signs, wonders, healings, miracles, revival. Um, and yet, despite all of those wonderful things that we've experienced in the past up until now, um, it's kind of interesting that that stuff hasn't truly generated a more wide-scale change in heart. It's kind of like we're still looking for God to amuse and entertain, with, entertain us with supernatural things, but... When you look at the fruit of it, um, are we changed at all? Are, have our hearts perceived or conceived something differently of the Lord? It, uh, have we allowed His grace to um, sever us from our earthly identity, our natural name, like the company in the book of the Revelation 
I saw this fifth angel ascending from the east. Has, has the light of his grace and the love seen through that grace uh, severed us from our earthly identity, our natural name? Because if it has, then with that will also come a separation from our uh, skin color, our ethnicity, our nationality. You know, my last name is Sealski. If you ever, S-I-E-L-S-K-I, -S think of a, a seal um, on, on two skis going down a ski slope. Seal ski, that's a, a simple way to remember it because the pronunciation trips up a lot of people. But, um, you know, a lot of Polacks spelt their name with an S-K-I on the end. And um, that's always usually, it's, it, it kind of uh, has, uh, in Polish, it has um, what it's saying in, in a sense is that they are a dweller of a certain area. Um, like a, uh, well, a person from New York would be called a New Yorker, you know, that sort of thing. Well, with Polish, it's seal ski. It would be like um, my first, the first part of my, my last name. Um, I had done some studying a while ago, and it, it basically uh, comes from a town in Poland, uh, Cielo. Uh, and <clears throat> instead of saying, oh, he was one of them Cieloers, they would say, oh, he's a Sielski. He's a, he's a dweller of Cielo. It used to be uh, Shelowski. There are actually people who say the last name that's similar to mine, Shelski. That's, Shelski is actually the correct Polish pronunciation of my last name, Shelski, like a, like a shell, Shelski, uh, but in English it's Sielski. So it's just an inhabitant of Cielo. And so, uh, but see, here's the thing. Uh, oh, and by the way, um, for those of you who are all as racially sensitive, ethnically sensitive, you know why Polacks have the, 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 the suffix S-K-I on the end of their name sometime? Because they don't know how to spell toboggan. <laughs> So, and hey, you know what? I wasn't even offended at that comment. So, <clears throat> anyway, um, when we understand the Father's love and the true light of grace, um, with that also comes the knowledge that um, His grace, it severs us from the earthly view of things. It severs us from our earthly identity, severs us from our natural name. R remember the company in the Revelation chapter 7 I shared with you guys about um, that they ascend, I saw this angel ascending from the east, because they, they caught, they were the first company, it was a company of people, they're the first to uh, recapture, uh, comprehend again the light of the Father's love through grace. And it doesn't further enable them uh, to keep harboring the false identity that they have that is based on all these outward natural things. Grace actually severs them from these things. So in the natural, my last name is Sealski. Um, if you ever had a picture of my earthly mom and my dad, um, you could definitely tell that I came from the two of them. And although they were the vehicle through which I entered this physical earth, the spirit that lives within this body is not Polish. The spirit that lives within this body doesn't have this skin color. Apostle Paul made this profound statement in Galatians chapter 1, and I guess we can turn there. I'm just going to take my time on this a little bit. Um, Galatians chapter 1. Uh, I guess we'll start here in verse 3. Apostle Paul says in Galatians chapter 1, he says, Grace be to you, and peace from God the Father. Grace be to you, and peace from God the Father, and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins. Say, so why doesn't he ever talk about sin? I just did. Jesus gave himself for your sins. All of you sin lovers out there. He gave himself for our sins. In fact, he absorbed the sin of the whole world into one human vessel. And when he died, he shattered the power of sin and freed us from it. Because we were in him when, he, if the wages of sin is death, and we were all included in his sacrifice, and when he died, we were in him when he died, therefore we all died together with him, well, in his death, we've been freed from sin. Since when does sin have dominion over a dead man? 
See, I've talked about sin. Are you taking notes? At least I'm talking about it from a New Covenant point of view. I realize some people may have never heard it this way, but it's the New Covenant. Um, he gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. And this goes back to Jesus' prayer in John chapter 17, that we would be kept in the world but free of the world. We are in it, but not of it. We are in it, but we are not like it. And it's grace that facilitates this, and the peace that comes from the Father, who in Christ gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world. Grace delivers us from this present evil world. It cuts us off from what is driving the world in which we live. He goes on and he says, uh, um, I guess we read verse 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. So see, there are people today who think that grace is part of the gospel. That is not true. Grace is the gospel. It is the whole thing. Grace is the gospel. Look at what he said again. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you uh, into the grace of Christ, that you are so soon removed unto another gospel. Look at what he just called the grace of Christ. He called it the gospel. And he said, which is not another gospel. There are a lot of posers out there. There are a lot of messages that are posing as the gospel, and it's not the gospel. If it isn't grace, it isn't the gospel. Grace is not part of the gospel. Grace is the gospel. Because in the grace of Christ is revealed the love of the Father. And not only the love of the Father, but our union that we share with the Father in the physical body of Jesus Christ. And that is the good news. Um... He said, but there be some that uh, trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. There are some that trouble you and would pervert grace. There's a whole issue in the book of the Revelation. All seven churches forsook grace. Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy toward the end of his life, and I can imagine the heaviness and the tears he must have been crying. He said, all they who are in Asia have forsaken me. Where are all seven churches in the book of the Revelation? Asia. They had all forsaken uh, what Paul imparted to them, they had all forsaken the gospel of grace, and they've got mixed up again with legalism, Moses, the dead letter of scripture, the keeping of the law, the performance requirements and obedience standards of the dead letter of scripture. They got all caught up in that again. My wife and I were just talking this morning about the church of Ephesus. You know, the first church mentioned out of the seven, and you know, the word Ephesus means to throw out and to hit the mark. And one of the things that the church of Ephesus became guilty of um, once they forsook the gospel of grace, is they made it their mission to begin policing one another and the world regarding sin. They donned themselves, they appointed themselves as the royal righteous rangers against sin, God's holy police force against iniquity. And so instead of um, pouring out the love of Christ, instead of pouring out that spirit of the Father's heart to people, what they did was they went on a mission to snuff out sin. Now, who does that sound like today? In my growing up, in my years on this earth, that's, to me, the majority of the outward appearance that the church has given the world. They are on a, 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 an ass, an, a holy assignment to snuff out sin. But what about love? That's why in the first thunder in the book of the Revelation, you have that first abomination of the antichrist or self-righteous spirit called the beast, you have his first abomination cited in the Ephesian church, the proud look. Because you see, whenever we start thinking that our right standing with God is based on our being able to hit the mark every time, there's pride present. And the only solution for it would be the first uh, facet 
of the Spirit of Christ, which is the Spirit of divine love. So the first thunder in the book of the Revelation, when you read the first church with the first seal, and then the first trumpet, and then the first angel, and then the first vial or bowl, and then sixth and lastly, the sixth vial angel or plague angel, when you read those together and meditate on them, what you're going to see is how the Lamb in his, the Lamb, he is the gospel. He is the unveiling of the gospel. How through uh, the Lamb himself, the gospel, the true gospel of grace, as it opens those seven seals on his life within us, one of the first things that happens is that proud look that the Ephesian church exhibited is dealt with with the love of the Father. Because I'm going to tell you, the only cure for a proud look is the love of the Father. And at first, that love of the Father actually provokes that proud look. I mean, when you start telling people that salvation is free, there's nothing you need to do in order to get saved, that Jesus has single-handedly saved you. Everyone's been included. No one's been excluded outside of the circle of Jesus' sacrifice, outside of the realm or scope of his sacrifice. Man, the fangs come out, the claws start to show, what do you mean? We need to tell the world about sin. Since when is sin their savior? I think we should tell them about their savior and what he did and what his death unveils and how much love the Father has for them all, us all, as it is revealed in and through the Lamb and his sacrifice. Anyway, but I digress. Um... There are some that would pervert the gospel of Christ. Galatians 1.8, But though we are an angel from heaven, all of you angel worshipers out there, there's multitudes of Christians who are worshiping angels, angelic beings. Listen to this. Though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, what is the gospel? Grace. Though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be a curse. Now watch this. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. Paul pronounces a double curse <laughs> because in all honesty, anyone who is preaching any other quote unquote gospel unto you or me other than grace is basically... Uh, Tra uh, transferring that that spirit of bondage itself, and that is a cursed spirit, the spirit of bondage to fear. Verse 10, he says, For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? If I yet pleased men, um, I should not be the servant of Christ. When you preach grace, pure grace, in its undiluted form, you're going to anger people. The thing is, is if you live to please people, you're going to have a problem. You're going to adjust your message accordingly to make sure people like you. You can still remain in and tight and close with certain people groups. And uh, yes, yeah, you think about going into politics, people pleasing politician. Change like the, change like the wind, change like the weather. Uh, verse 11, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not according to man. Paul says, I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it in Bible school or seminary. ruh -roh. <laughs> He said, But I received it by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my conversation or manner of life in times past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and I profited in the Jews' religion. There it is. Money. We're going to talk about money sometime soon. I might not have any uh, subscribers after this one, after that one, I guess. We're talking about racism, and we're talking about money. Christians do a lot of stupid, dumb stuff with their money, all in the name of the Lord. It's time somebody addresses it. We show more faith in the stock market with our money than we do the power of God. 
which is why we won't give and support the gospel. But man, if there's a new stock that emerges, oh, you got to jump on that. Invest. Money is quite the revealer of the heart, isn't it? And the desires of the heart. I profited in the Jews' religion above many of my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. Yeah, there's that word, that T word, traditions. It should be a four-letter word. Jesus actually taught in the Gospels there was only one thing that made the word of God of no effect, and it wasn't unbelief. It's only one thing that makes the word of God of no effect. The traditions of men. Wow. Now check this out, verse 15. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb, he cut me off from my earthly identity and natural name. Remember, Apostle, or Apostle Paul didn't start out as Paul. He was Saul of Tarsus. When it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. How did he separate Paul from his mother's womb? How did he separate Saul of Tarsus from his mother's womb? He called him by his grace. Remember that fifth angel in the book of the Revelation, chapter 7, and I saw another, ascend, uh, another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. If you are sealed unto grace, you are also simultaneously cut off from everything else. In fact, in Romans chapter 1, which we'll look at in a second, Paul calls himself an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ who has been separated unto the gospel. What does that mean? I have been severed, I have been sealed unto grace, but the implication is I'm cut off from everything else. And in all honesty, everything else has lost its appeal including the value of my skin color, the nationality of my last name, whether I'm male or female, or any of this confusing sexual identification that's going on today. All of those things are outer court. They deal with the natural. They deal with the physical. You say, well, I know who I am. If you're focusing on any of those things as the basis of your identity, you have yet to discover who you are in Christ. Because you are a spirit who happens to live in that physical vessel. This is actually not me. This is a housing for a spirit that came from God. That's all this is. This is a smoke screen. And just like if you live in a house or an apartment, your house or your apartment has a mailing address. Now, I live in a home. I'm thankful for it. But my home is not who I am. I just live here. I come and go as I please. Um, if people want to send me mail, they know my mailing address. They send me mail. It comes here, and I receive their mail. Um, if people want to visit, they know my street and my, my, my that, the number of my house. They come to this house to visit, not the house the one who lives in it. But thank God I am not the color of my house. <laughs> I just happen to live in the house. Well, the same thing is true with you and I. This is the house that we live in. My natural name, John Joseph Sealski III, is just my mailing address. It's how people can... Um, you know, call out unto me, or, or and, and I'll know that they're talking about me, or talking to me, or trying to. It gets my attention. But my name is just my mailing address. But me, myself, in and of myself, in, in this housing, I am a spirit. I came from God, and I'm going to return to Him. He's my Father. The natural parents that I had... Um, the, the DNA of their lineage and so on and so forth that combined um, furnished this temporary housing that I live in right now, um, gave it the look that it has, and, you know, it was the Lord's will, I guess, that I came out this way. Uh, I am a male. I am not confused about that. And, uh, and 
but none of those th those are things in the natural. Those are outer court issues. And if we're basing, you know, when we're talking about the Old Testament tabernacle, it had three compartments. It had the outer court, it had the holy place, which is the soul, and it had the most holy place, which is the spirit. The outer court would be the body. It's the part of us, uh, the part of our being that is exposed to natural light, sun, moon, stars, the elements, heat, cold, four seasons, you know, uh, you know, spring, summer, fall, winter. You know, th this outer court can feel those things and senses those things. But then you go to the holy place, which is that middle part of the tabernacle, which represents the soul, the mind, will, and emotions. And then even deeper yet is that most holy place, which is the spirit. And see, the soul and the spirit, they're not exposed directly to natural light, sun, moon, stars, all these other things. But this is, because this is outer court. It's not who I am. And for me to insist and to demand that this is my identity and it's a part of me, um, it's connected to me. It's the housing in which I live. But trust me, it's not me. And unless the perusia should happen, I'm going to step out of this meat sack. I don't care what color or nationality it is. And I'm going to immediately be in the presence of my father as I was before. So then why are we getting so hung up on this? Could it be in our thinking that we're carnal and naturally minded? And I think probably this is the part where I'd like to branch off further at a later date. But for the purpose of what we're looking at today, let's just look at this in Galatians 1. Verse 15, when it pleased God, Paul goes on here and he says, who separated me from my mother's womb. What does that mean? Well, everything up, you know, he, um, he, uh, his lifestyle and time passed in the Jews' religion, um, his notor uh, uh, renown for persecuting the church, his financial profit in the Jews' religion, um, his being caught up in the traditions of the fathers. His he was a Pharisee of the Pharisee. That was Paul's uh, uh, Saul of Tarsus denomination. His natural name, the weight that it carried. He was, he was a very sought-after scholar. He was, uh, as far as the, the righteousness that Moses describes and what the law required, he was an expert on all of it. But man, when that grace hit him, it severed him from all of it. It cut him off from all of it. Everything that he had, on which he had based his identity, and that he had worked so hard and studied so hard to obtain, at least in the eyes of men, he lost it all. Grace separated from him from his mother's womb. For what purpose? To reveal his son in me. That's the apocalypse. That Christ would be unveiled. Apocalypse does not mean the end of the world for the love of God. Get a Greek dictionary and look it up. It does not mean the end of the world. It does not mean the end of time. Apocalypse comes from two Greek words. Apo, which means to remove, and kalupto, which means the veil. It is an exposure, an apocalypse. You know when you when you, there's like a lunar eclipse or a solar eclipse, this is an apocalypse. It's not necessarily one object coming in front of another and blocking it. It is, it is a person who is exposing and revealing himself from within another. Not a separate entity blocking out someone else, but a living person who is unveiling himself within another and through another. That's the, that's the Greek definition of the term apocalypse, the apocalypsis of Jesus Christ, the book of the Revelation, the book of the apocalypse, or the apocalypse as they call it. 
My, my, my. To reveal his son in me, this is why grace separated from his, him from his mother's womb. And see, if we don't allow grace to separate us from our mother's womb, if we don't allow grace to cut us off from our earthly identity, our natural name, our skin color, our nationality, our ethnicity, I guarantee you we will never truly preach the pure, undiluted gospel. Because the gospel is not our freedom to continue to engage in those superficial things. It's freedom from those superficial external things. When it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me. Why? That I might preach him. Not myself, not my skin color, not my ethnicity, nationality, not the country in which I live, not the flag of my country, not my gender, not my sexual preference, that I might preach him. Paul says, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Or in other words, my initial response, based on this revelation that came to me, was that I really should not waste my time going to anyone else seeking a second opinion. Because he knew where he got it from. It was given to him by direct revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And those people to this day, they're apostles on the earth right now. I know some. There are apostles of the Lamb, and then there are still apostles today. There's a difference. The original 12 apostles of the Lamb, that's the 12 apostles of the Lamb. But there are apostles today, and the, and they're, they're still for today because grace is for today. The five-fold ministry, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Five, grace. If, if those ministry gifts are not for today, then neither is grace. And you know that that's not true. Just because the church itself has acted like a harlot and grossly perverted the image of the Father to the whole world, that does not give us the right to declare with our ignorant mouths that the fivefold ministry is no longer necessary. You say, well, brother, in Hebrews it says, in that day, uh, uh, they shall not teach every man his brother, saying, Know ye the Lord. That's one thing. There is a personal, intimate fellowship and relationship with the Lord that once the light bulb clicks on, you have a revelation of it, you can begin enjoying and experiencing right where you are right now. However, the fivefold ministry is not a substitute for your fellowship with your Father. The fivefold ministry, if you read Ephesians 4 correctly, the fivefold ministry is equipped to empower you to actually reach out and minister. I know lots of people today who have some sort of a, 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 a greater depth of relationship, of fellowship with the Lord. But when it comes to actually talking with people, when it comes to ministering to people, at least outside of the four walls of the church, they stumble all over themselves. The fivefold ministry is meant to equip people for the work of the ministry. It doesn't mean that with it doesn't mean that without the fivefold ministry you can't know the Father. That's not true. But the fivefold ministry has a specific calling and gifting within and as it relates to the body of Christ, and it is to equip people to begin allowing that spirit and that fellowship to pour out of them to touch others. That's different. But anyway, I digress again. So, grace severs us from our earthly identity and natural name. Saul of Tarsus became Paul, the apostle. And so I want to go over here also to Ephesians chapter 2 for a second. And while we're doing that, I will point out that one verse of Scripture in Romans 1 that I mentioned so as not to forget. Romans chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, watch this, separated unto the gospel of God. Separated unto grace. Because what grace does is it separates you from your mother's womb. 
it severs you from your earthly identity, severs you from your natural name, severs you from your skin color, severs you from your nationality, the country, and, and including the country of which you may be a natural citizen. Now, to be clear, I love my country. I, I genuinely do. Not in an idolatrous way, though. I love the country in which I live. I'm very thankful that I was born here. I'm grateful for that. However, my nationality and my natural citizenship is not my God. I do not worship the American flag. I have a respect for it. I have a respect for all of the men and women who died and shed their blood for the freedoms that we enjoy. I don't ever take that for granted or uh, hold that with a... Um, an indifferent attitude. I'm very grateful, but my country is not my God. My government is not my God. And contrary to popular belief, God is not government. We've turned government into a God, for sure, and even assessed people's eternal destinations based on their um, uh, political party affiliation but God is not government. Oh, but Romans chapter 13, brother, the powers that be are ordained of God. And they're, uh, yeah, but you might want to read Romans chapter 13 a few hundred more times because he's actually not talking about natural government there. He's talking about something that it hits much closer to home. If God is government, then why did the people who first came to this, or, you know, the, the original American re uh, Revolution, if, if God is government, then how dare we rebel against England? Because to rebel against England would be to rebel against God, but then we wouldn't have this country, would we? It's one of the ma many multitudes and myriads of reasons that the church is so screwed up. We have these just misconceptions and misinterpretations about Scripture we're reading into the dead letter instead of allowing the Spirit to cause us to see the Father's love in the Scripture. And they are two different animals. One's a beast, one's a lamb. So, um, but, no, but Paul said he was called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God. Because that's what grace does. It separates you from everything. It cuts you off from all of this earthly stuff, this natural stuff, this carnally minded stuff, and it, it, it reintroduces you to the eternal fellowship with your Father in the realm of your spirit. My identity is my Father. The Father from whom I came my God, my Father, Abba Father, Daddy God. He's my identity, and the Lamb is His express image. You give me any other image or expression of my Father other than the Lamb, you lie. I know, because I've seen Him. And there's no one like Him, except those who are seeing Him also. Because as we see him, we become just like him, transformed from one degree of glory to a much greater glory. We all, with open face, unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are transformed, metamorphosized into the same image. Those who know him and see him as a lamb, well, the same love in the lamb will be in them toward others. And those who perceive him as a dragon or a pharaoh in heaven who's ever crouching and waiting to reward obedience and punish disobedience, well, they will be that very beast to others. Where there is no revelation of the Lamb, it doesn't mean that what Jesus legally accomplished isn't valid for everyone. It just means that not in every person is that knowledge. The light bulb has not clicked on for everyone. 
wherever that light bulb has not clicked on, wherever there is no revelation of the Lamb, there will be a beast present. And that beast, a beast in the wild, thinks of no one and hunts for no one other than itself. Unless it has young, then all it cares about is its own family. That's a beast. And the thing is about the self-righteous spirit that is the beast is its mentality is one of unless someone else practices my religion the exact way I do, unless someone else has my skin color, unless someone else has my nationality, then they are not as close and tight and right with God as I am. You know that self-righteousness that is the root of all racism. Because self-righteousness, as well as racism, deifies self. On a most superficial level. But self-righteousness and racism together, they deify self. If it doesn't look like me, smell like me, act like me, worship like me, have my daily routines like me, it can't be as right and tight with God as I am. So let's go to Ephesians 2 here in the amount of time we have left. I cannot figure out really for the life of me other than lack of balls, if you want to say it that way, or guts I should say, why well, I haven't heard more preachers and teachers talk about this chapter because Ephesians chapter 2, my Lord, it deals with this issue. So I'm just going to go right at it. Uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Let's just cut right to the chase here. Wherefore, remember that you being... Paul's writing to the Ephesian church. He says, remember that in time past, uh, you were Gentiles in the flesh, which is true, who are called the uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. And what he's referring to is that the natural Jew is referred to in his writings as the circumcision. It's the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. Um, we'll get into Apostle Paul's dung pile list and the significance of what he really means when he talks about he was literally separated from his earthly name and how, um, how heavy of a weight that was. It was lifted off of him. But... Um, When a male child was born to a Jewish family, and I guess most still practice this today, on the eighth day, eight is the number of new beginnings, the father would pronounce the name on the child, and the child would be circumcised. And so, in this context of Scripture, the natural Jews are the circumcision, and their term for the Gentile world is the uncircumcision. So, remember in times past being Gentiles in the flesh who were called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, the natural Jew, that at that time you could say you Gentiles, Ephesians, were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, not part of the Jewish nation, right? And strangers from the covenants of promise. Now, this was, this was the Jewish view of the Gentile world having no hope and without God in the world. That's how the natural Jew perceived the Gentile, how the circumcision perceived the uncircumcision. Verse 13, But now, in Christ Jesus, you Gentiles, who sometimes were far off, because the natural Jew viewed the Gentiles as extremely distant from God. We just read what they called them. It was, uh, they called them the uncircumcised. Um, <clears throat> they were without the anointing, without Christ. Um, they were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. They weren't natural Jewish citizens, so they were, you know, 
dogs, basically. Um, they were strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and the natural Jew viewed the Gentile as having, quote, as not, I should say it this way, the natural Jew viewed the Gentile as not having God in the world. But Paul says this, But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off, you Gentiles, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. You remember when Jesus was betrayed, the Jews came and, and went to the Garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane and laid their hands on him. And then they turned him over to the Romans, the Gentiles, who also laid their hands on him. And what that did was it enabled Jesus as our Savior, our Savior God, to draw into one physical vessel from all generations all the way back to Adam into infinite generations into the future. One man drew into his physical vessel, one vessel, the entire sin of the whole world, the entire Adamic race. He pulled it into himself to fulfill the Old Testament type and shadow of the sacrificial offerings. It gets better. Verse 14. Right after he says, Now in Christ, you who sometimes who were afar off are made nigh, he goes on and he says, For he is our peace. He is the Jews' peace also. Peace here is the Greek word irene, which means oneness. That's how close you are with him. You are one with him. Not because of a sinner's prayer you prayed, but because of Jesus' sacrifice and what he accomplished in the body of his flesh, all on his own. He has, for he is our peace, who has made both Jew and Gentile one. And has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. You do know that there used to be a court of the Jews and a court of the Gentiles. The wall that separated those courts has been obliterated. Because all Jews and all Gentiles were included in the physical body of Jesus' flesh in his sacrifice. He is our peace, who has made both Jew and Gentile one, and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh on the cross the enmity, the hostility. Uh, another word is the opposition and the hatred between Jew and Gentile. There's your racism. See, the cross, the revelation of the cross, folks, it destroys, it annihilates, it obliterates racism. Passing laws isn't going to change racism. The passing of laws has failed to this day because the passing of laws regarding uh, racism does not change or affect the human heart. It does not bring the heart into a different perspective of how the Father views everyone. No legislation of any law, no matter how well written by man, can change the human heart. You got people today, um, uh, oh gosh, we should legalize being white. We should legalize being black. We need laws that legalize this. And I, I get where they're coming from. I understand where they're coming from and, and the, heart of, the heart cry of what they're saying. But the fact of the matter is, no amount of legislation of any man-made laws on the books is going to change the mess that we're in because it can't transform the heart. The church has been the greatest false prophet of them all. Because the church itself, over the decades that I've been on this planet, I... The majority of Christians that I have met over the years worship the natural Jew. They say that the natural Jew is God's chosen people. That, in a sense, we have to worship them and show them reverence. Because if we don't, then God won't bless us. Now, I am in no wise advocating that any race or ethnicity of people have something done to them. Like the crazy people like Stalin and Hitler did. Let me be clear. I love all natural Jewish people. I love all Polish people. 
I love all German people. I love all Russian people. I want to give them all a hug in hopes that we'll forget about our Jewishness, Germanness, Russianness, and Polishness. But also, I am not saying that we need to bow to a particular ethnicity because that's idolatry. And I don't care if you don't like it. We are all the Father's chosen in Christ Jesus. And what did Apostle Peter learn in Acts chapter 10 when he was offended to even step foot in Cornelius' house, even after the Spirit gave him a vision that what God has cleansed, don't call that common, referring to the Gentiles. Paul, or excuse me, Apostle Peter in his lightning quick mind, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons because he gave this 120 Gentile people the gift of the Holy Ghost like he did for us. Very good! You know, Peter was the one who was the first to receive the call to the Gentiles. But he still had these racial and prejudice hang-ups. That's why Paul eventually got sent. Because Peter was fighting with it. He really was. But then again, Peter wrote of Paul's revelation and said, you know, there are some things that Apostle Paul wrote about that, well, frankly, they're things that are hard to be understood. You never hear Paul saying that about Peter's revelation. But Peter did say that about Paul's revelation. Because Peter, for some reason, despite all of the things that he had seen and experienced, there was still that hanging on to that Jewishness. So check it out. Verse 15, Ephesians 2. Having abolished in his flesh, in the cross of Jesus Christ, in the physical body of his flesh. I told you, he didn't just die for us, he died as us. Hebrews says we have such a high priest who literally became us. How do you become Jew and Gentile at the same time? Well, it's very simple. You destroy the wall that divides them and puts a difference between them. Just break it down. In the body of his own flesh, he broke it down. He included them all in one himself. He abolished in his flesh the enmity. That is the Greek word hostility. It also um, uh, is the word that means opposition and hatred. Anywhere there's racism, prejudice, and bigotry, there is no revelation of the cross, period. I don't care if you do call yourself a Christian nation. I don't care if you have the Ten Commandments slathered on every government building in your nation's capital and state capitals. I don't care how well your politicians can quote the Ten Commandments. The fact of the matter is wherever there is racism, there is no revelation of the cross and the mystery that was unveiled in the body of Jesus' flesh. having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances to make in himself of two, Jew and Gentile, one new man. Let me remind you of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Because we have this, we still got this twisted idea today that this new creation is a combination of Jew and Gentile. It is not. If any man be in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away, have died. And behold, all things are become new. The term new creation is defined as a new species of being that never before existed. Neither Jew nor Gentile, but a completely brand new creation. Sons of the living God, daughters of the Almighty, whose origin, when, when Jesus said, you know, he said, uh, he said to Peter, he said, upon this rock, I will build my church. What rock? Well, Peter, he was the first pope. That's a complete misunderstanding of that scripture. Did you know that the ancient term for father is foundation? Rock. Upon this rock, upon the revelation of the father. 
when Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? And they all said what everyone else is saying on Christian TV and all Christian authors that you can purchase in every Christian bookstore. They just kept saying like an empty-headed parrot everything that they heard everything everyone else saying. Then Jesus turns the tables and says, but who do you say that I am? Magically, eleven shut up. They have nothing to say. It's amazing what happens when you cut off the source of information that most people are feeding off of that doesn't involve a personal, intimate fellowship with the Father themselves. They got nothing to say. And Peter chimes up and he says, you are the Christ, the Son, the Son of the living God. Jesus says to Peter, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you. What did Paul say? When it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, called me by his grace. The gospel that was preached of me is not according to men. I did not receive it of men, but by the direct revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus says to Peter, he said, flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, that I'm the Christ, the Son of the living God, but my Father. And upon this rock, upon this foundation, upon knowing the Father, not God, not Jehovah, not he whose name which shall not be spoken, upon this rock, upon this foundation, upon this deep, intimate knowing of the Father. I'll build my church, and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. Do you know what the gates of hell are? Read the Psalms. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door, the gates of my lips. The, ma the, gates, of the, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There's the gates. Why are they called the gates of hell? Because they're attached to a self-righteous heart. The gates of hell are the mouths of the self-righteous. And when the church comes into that deep, intimate knowing of the Father, no big mouth from no self-righteous camp will be able to prevail. Because the fire of his love will consume them all. <laughs> and turn them around and upside down and inside out and every which way but loose. How you like them apples? Okay, let's move on here because we need to close. But I don't finish up this time, I guess. We're going to have to do a second round. Um, anyway, he abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments. See, that was one of the reasons why the Jews thought that they were better than the Gentiles was because they had the scriptures. It's the same reason why the Christian today thinks they're better than, quote, sinners. They have the scriptures. But they're not having necessarily fellowship with the God of the scriptures, whose heart is full of nothing but love for the world. Because last time I checked, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, see, no, no ethnicity issue, no ethnicity preference. Oh, I never did say what Peter found out. Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons because God gave the Jew or the Gentiles the same Holy Ghost that he gave to the Jews. Very good, Peter. He's no respecter of persons. He's no respecter of ethnicity. He's no respecter of gender. He's no respecter of race. He's no respecter of nationality. He's no respecter of national citizenship. So then why is it that the harlot church keeps worshiping the natural Jew? See, until the church changes, the world is not. She was called to be the light. She was called to be a shining example of that father's love. And instead, what she has opted for, among other things, is donning herself as the official royal righteous rangers against sin and God's uh, holy company uh, uh, who are called to snuff out iniquity. And she forgot all about love. She forgot all about the heart of the message. The heart of the gospel is not about sin. The heart of the gospel is the Father's love. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation goes for therein, in the gospel, in the grace, is the righteousness of God revealed. Not the sin of man, the righteousness of God. What have we been studying in Romans chapter 10? That the righteousness of God is the love of the Father. For therein, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for therein is the love of the Father revealed in spite of your sin. 
Your sin could not stop him from loving you, and my sin could not stop him from loving me. I was just reading in Psalm 106 this morning about how when the Lord initially brought Israel out of the control of Pharaoh and brought them to the Red Sea, it says even at the Red Sea, they didn't even get so far as the wilderness. At the Red Sea, they're already wanting to turn and go back to a land that was already decimated and ravaged with all the plagues. There was nothing to go back to, Einstein. But it says they actually tempted him and provoked him at the sea, even at the Red Sea. They hadn't even couldn't cross the Red Sea yet, and they're already provoking him to anger. But then it says, yet he saved them for his own name's sake. He saved them despite them. <laughs> and we want to act so high and holy that we need to pray some prayer or rearrange our lives or, or clean up before God can, quote, officially save us so we can have our famous born-on Christian date slapped on our foreheads. You want to talk about the mark of the beast, that's definitely one of them. And here he is, loving us and saving us in spite of ourselves, and without having a lick of sense in our own thinking and understanding to know what he actually did. That's why we need the Spirit. There's a, there's a reason why these terms are used. It's the Spirit that quickens. Why? Because most of us all are slow. <laughs> it takes us a while to catch up. But thank God, he did it despite us. He is merciful. He is patient. He has compassion on the ignorant. At least that's what it says of my high priest in Hebrews. He is compassionate on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way. And he is just waiting for someone to give just enough attention to say, let me show you something here. Do you see this? And then you have those aha moments and it's like, oh my God, I've been so dumb. Quickening. Quickenings for people who are slow. I'm one of them. I admit. For to make in himself of twain one new man. Not a combination of Jew and Gentile, but a completely brand new creation that's never, a new species of being that never before walked the earth, face of the earth. Not Jew, not Gentile. It says that in Colossians, where there is neither Jew nor Gentile. Let me just read that to you because I know Christians don't read their Bible, especially the New Testament. Colossians chapter 3. Then, my goodness, we need to close. Um, Colossians chapter 3. Um, it says in verse 9, Colossians 3, Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him. What is the image of him? Oh, he's a lamb. He's not a dragon. Which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where, meaning in Christ, where, there is neither Greek nor Jew. Or you could say, where there is neither Gentile nor Jew. It's not a mixture of Jew and Gentile. In Christ, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. Ah! There is neither circumcision nor uncircumcision. Not a mixture. Neither either of them. Woohoo! Jesus didn't go to the cross and rise from the dead so he could continue to fuel a mixed up creation that is just as goofy and confused as it has always been. He rose to bring forth something completely brand new. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Woo! I love that. He's in everyone. It's just not everyone has woken up to it. <laughs> Oh, I will gladly be excluded from your conferences and meetings in church, and I will gladly be blacklisted for this stuff so I can talk to some precious people on YouTube about what brings joy to my heart and a smile to my face. I don't care who likes it, who doesn't. It doesn't matter to me. I don't give a rip. This stuff is freeing. Christ is all and in all. See, there's that Christ in you, the hope of glory. Uh, so let's go back to Ephesians 2. 
um, to make in himself of twain, two, verse 15, Ephesians 2, I mean, Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians 2, to make in himself of two, Jew and Gentile, one brand new man, so making peace. Not a combination of Jew and Gentile, a completely brand new creation where there is neither Jew nor Gentile. He's delivered us from the outer court. That's one of the things grace does when you capture the light of it. It's like, I am more than this. I am more than my skin color. I am so much more than my gender and my physical appearance. That he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross. The Jews didn't need a Jewish Savior and the Gentiles a Gentile Savior. It was one man who came, one, one man who uh, was God incarnate who came for both Jew and Gentile to destroy all the hostility, the animosity, um, the hatred between Jew and Gentile, destroyed that middle wall, broke it down, then put all Jew, Gentile together in one, put them all to death in one fell swoop, so that when he rose, he brought everyone in him out of that place with him and presented them as a completely brand new creation, completely free of all this natural, external, superficial, superficial, shallow crap. We are all one in him. He is in all of us. I don't care what your skin color is. I don't care what nationality you are, ethnicity. I don't care what flag you live under. We are bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. And I told you before, and you're going to see it at some point. I don't know when. Perhaps the future. The Lord is going to swoop in and he's going to remove the flags of all nations and the boundaries that divide us. Because there's no division in love. And when the love that hung on the cross of Calvary lives and beats in our chest toward one another, I mean tangibly, there will be no more need for national boundaries and differences and all those sorts of things. In fact, you won't even need natural government. As if the love of God is the abiding factor, that divine love and inspiration and the power of his anointing through us will more than take care of everyone's needs without being under the control of the rich and corrupt. That he might present both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. And he came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them that were nigh, the Jew and the Gentile, are being awakened and alerted to a message that says there is no more difference between Jew and Gentile. The animosity, the hatred, the hostility. Look at the cross. See how he's included and loved everyone. And keep looking at that cross until the love that hangs there is real in your heart toward one another. The cross is the only cure for racism. There is no other cure. You can, Like I said, you can elect the officials, you can have the elections, you can have the correct laws on the books, but... You can attempt to legislate morality, but uh, man-made laws cannot change the condition of the heart. Only the gospel can open the eyes of the understanding to an otherworldly love that then transforms everything about that life. So I, I don't think I'm going to be able to keep this to one, so I think we're going to look into this again next time, early next week sometime. Hope you got something out of that. Um, there are a few other things that Apostle Paul says well, there's a lot that he says, but I only have, there's a few in particular that I feel an impression to discuss a little bit more uh, in the next video, and uh, hopefully it will shed some more light on this subject, which uh, is quite an extensive subject in the New Testament. So uh, anyway, hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend. It's a bright, sunny Saturday afternoon here in West Lawn, PA. Um, tomorrow meeting, I don't know who is going to see this or be able to show up tomorrow, but um, tomorrow morning, 10 a.m., in our regular Sunday meetings, we're going to be starting to look at the sixth angel, which is the fourth, um, the fourth attribute. 
of the sixth thunder, the sixth angel, and uh, move along in our study of the apocalypse. So for those of you who can make it great, for those who watch by video, we appreciate it. Look forward to seeing you next time. God bless you. Have a great rest of your day. And uh, get out there and just give, give a lot of different people some hugs today because, uh, you know, we are his ambassadors. So let's, uh, let's convey the love. All right. God bless you.